We now begin with panel discussion to well-being in maritime. May I request everyone to kindly take the seats? The well-being of seafarers is a long-standing concern in the maritime sector. Seafarer well-being is increasingly understood as a key influencer of the sector's safety and sustainability. With every type of industry stakeholder, companies, regulators, ship owners, ship managers, etc. having a role to play in its assurance. Both physiological and psychological safety of seafaring community is the need of our. To set the premise on this important concern, I request Mr. Pradeep Kulkarni, Claims Head Marine Insurance, Ace Insurance Private Limited to deliver the prelude and set the stage for the panel discussion ahead. May I please have Mr. Pradeep Kulkarni on stage with us? Do we have him in here? Uh, first of all, good morning everybody. Good morning. I am thankful to the organizers and also to Marex for giving me this opportunity for giving the introduction to the panel discussion which is very important from the manpower or from the HR point of view. This panel discussion is well-being in maritime industry and the, my topic given to me is trains in the merit, medical claims. So I will be talking on the trains in the medical claims here. See this data which we have collected for this uh, particular topic. We have collected it from uh, Gar p and Club, being the biggest club in the group uh, p and Clubs. They have got the highest number of ships and uh, the data, the analysis which they have done represents the global shipping. So there may be some contradiction between Gar Club and other clubs, but we have basically considered Gar Club as the being the biggest club, the data the being the valid one actually. So we will just uh, start the PPT here. This is the. So we have been talking last two days about the maritime industry and the manpower there. So we have been discussing that manpower is very critical, it is very important, and from this point of view, well-being of the seafarers is also very critical. Skilled and competent manpower is always essential or a critical asset for any type of industry, let it be shipping or let it be any other industry which is shore based. Because the efficiency or the, uh, the financial performance of the company ultimately depends on the performance of your manpower. That is the main thing. So, so to begin with, of course, we have discussed many of the challenges in the last two sessions also. But I have just summarized which are the challenges which are faced by the seafarers whenever, whenever they are on board. So we have just highlighted major challenges here. The first challenge is COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 pandemic, of course, this has eased out since last two years. But the fear of pandemic is still there in the minds of the seafarers. So which other challenges are Russian invasion of Ukraine, which is being faced by many seafarers. Transit through HR high risk areas. Many people, many seafarers are not mentally prepared to get transited through HR areas unless they are paid extra allowances. Excess use of social media. Of course, this particular uh, challenge is being faced by youngsters. The people who were selling earlier, this challenge was not there. But nowadays we see that many of the youngsters are involved in using excess social media like Facebook or other things. So the burden of these social challenges definitely affects the physical, mental and social well-being of the seafarers and ultimately it affects the operational efficiency of the ships and it is a big burden on the shipping companies. So these challenges <coughs> have to be faced whenever a person or seafarer is on board. We have seen that seafarers are on board for almost six to nine months and they are away from the home. Today morning only I was discussing with somebody whether he had a sleep 
yesterday evening. So he said, I could not sleep because I, I was away from the home. And we see the seafarers are away from the home from six to nine months. So what kind of challenges these people must be facing? Now as far as the train of the crew claims are concerned, we have got certain graphs here, which I will just explain to you. The first graph is basically the overall frequency of crew claims based on the data of the last five years, from the policy year 2018 to 2022. You will see that there is always an increasing trend in the overall crew claims. The line, the dotted line shows that all the claims since 2018 to 2022 have been increasing. If you see from 2020 to 21, there is a tremendous increase and that increases mainly on account of the pandemic. So this is the first graph shows the overall frequency of crew claims. Then this overall frequency has been subdivided into injury claims, illness claims and the death claims. As far as the injury claims are concerned, fortunately it is seen that from 2019 to 2020 there was a big reduction in the claims. The basic reason for this, it is said that during the pandemic there was a slowdown in the shipping industry. So the transits were not so much there and that's the major reason why the injury claims have gone down. Of course this is as far as the guard club is concerned but we have seen for some other clubs there are injuries happening in these policy years also. As far as the illness claims are concerned, again we see there is a drastic increase from 2019 to 2021 and the increase is tremendous peak in 2021 mainly due to COVID-2019. Death claims are also there which has again gone up because of the COVID-2019 and it has again picked up during 2021. But at the same time, we must remember that even if there was a pandemic during 2021, our shipping industry never stopped. We continued our businesses and our seamen were fearlessly transiting through the ships. So that's a very good idea. That is why these people, the seafarers are called the global key workers of the shipping industry. And we must salute the fearlessness or tirelessness which they have shown during this pandemic. All of us working in the shore based industry, we were working either from the office or most of us were working from home also during this particular period. And we have seen many of the ships were quarantined also because I have handled many such claims during this quarantine period. People were not, people were, were kept in the hotels, our ships were quarantined, people were isolated but still they were working very fearlessly. So we must give a big round of schedule and applause to these people. Now, as far as the frequency of this claims is concerned, if you see on the right hand side, we have given frequencies. How the frequency is calculated for crew claims is number of uh, crew claims divided by number of ships for a particular policy, policy period. This is an average of the five years period. So, just to explain, it's point 37, the meaning of point 37 is, suppose we consider 100 ships, then there are 37 ships which has got a crew claim, overall crew claim which is further subdivided into injuries, illness and death claims. As far as injuries are concerned, there are 11 claims per 100 ships. As far as uh, illness is concerned, there are 25 claims per 100 ships. And as far as death is concerned, there is only one claim per 100 ships. That is what the statistics of the last five years says. Now this is a division made based on the number and the cost of the claims also. If you see the pie chart on the other side, the pie chart indicates the division of claims based on number of claims. So as far as illness is concerned, the percentage is 67 percent, injury claims are concerned, it is 30 percent and death claims, it is just 3 percent. But if you consider this number against the cost of the claims, you will find just for the 3 percent of the death claims, the cost of that those particular claims is 17 percent. This is mainly because of the huge amount of compensation which is paid to the to the seafarers who are dead. Whereas in case of illness, the, the percentage is almost the same. It is rather lower for the illness and for the injuries, it is also almost the same. The main feature of the crew claims is what happens. We have seen this P&I class last 3-4 years, they have been increasing the deductible amounts. 
The current deductible amount for majority of the ship owners is around 10,000 to 12,000 dollars. And most of the crew claims, if you see, 90% of the crew claims don't uh, reach to that particular level. So most of the expenses which are incurred for this crew, medical expenses are, are to be borne by the ship owners only. So that's a unique feature because ship owners are bearing big amount of expenses on account of medical claims. What we get is only the excess of deductible, which is very high amount. So this is also to be remembered if you want to curtail the expenses you know, over a long period of time. Now, as far as the expenses uh, type of illness are concerned, we have again bifurcated into top 10 types of illnesses. The top 10 nine of, uh, types of illnesses, COVID-19 is considered to be the highest during 2020-21. Of course, this is no longer existing. So next five, if we can consider abdominal pain, back pain, appendicitis, heart problems, infectious diseases, these are the major problems. Kidney stones also one of the major problems which we have seen. Lots of people have got this kind of illnesses and expenses incurred, again, they are not major expenses, but still we have to repatriate the people and keep on incurring those particular expenses. As far as the injury claims are concerned, we have seen the top uh, five, if we consider finger damages, Injury to the fingers, back, back injuries, knee injuries, hand and legs are the major, major kinds of injuries which are taking place. Fingers almost upon 40 to 25 percent of the total, amount, total injury claims and this mainly happens to the, either to the ratings or to the lower categories of the officers because they are mainly involved in these physical activities. We have also seen there are many back injuries taking place. Or head injuries also, although they are very less, but we have seen head injuries also taking place because people are falling either from the height or uh, while doing on the slippery decks, etc. In fact, I have seen one uh, major case, a young boy of just uh, 24 years, a trainee marine engineer, he fell down from a height of 15 meters wearing no helmet and today that fellow is permanently unfit, permanently incapacitated, sitting on a wheelchair, dependent on others for activities. So this is a very sad state of affair happening for such injury claims. This is also one of the major uh, thing. We have seen illness, but in the illness also, mental illness is one of the important uh, illness which has been ignored for many years. If you see the graph, the graph is for the period from 2010 to 2019 and it, the <coughs> yellow line indicates the deaths on account of illness or injury. There is a declining trend but if you see the other uh, bar chart, they, they are always constant. So deaths are on account of mental disorder or deaths on account of uh, suicides, they are almost constant. So there is no reduction in this particular kinds of uh, deaths happening due to medical uh, disorder or either due to suicides. So this is the point which has to be taken care of because uh, I think over a period of time there are so many cases happening either due to mental disorders or due to suicides. If you read this GAS data, it says GAS data from 2010 to 2019 and compare the number of deaths due to injuries and illness, we see a declining trend from 2013 which is shown in the uh, blue line. However, the mental illness and suicide, we say that numbers have remained somewhat unchanged. So this, this is a point of concern which has to be taken note of actually. Now as far as the distribution of mental illness is concerned, the club analysis says it is almost all people within any age group are equally vulnerable. But if I, again if you consider the age group between 26 to 46 years, it is consi consisting of more than 50 percent of the people. So the people in the age group of 26 to 40 years are more vulnerable to mental illness. Maybe the reason is because they are not used to this kind of hard life and the people going initially on the ships, they are not used to such a life and they suffer from the mental illnesses. Last week only again, we have seen one cadet missing from ship due to mental illness. The cadet is unfortunately not yet found. The search operation is still going on for last two days. This has happened in the south coast of the India the, and the cadet is just 21 years old. So such things are happening 
and we have to take care of mental illness in particular. We have seen the major challenges, but what are the major factors which are having this particular claims? So, as far as the ship is concerned, this is only pertaining to a ship only. We have divided the environmental factor affecting onboard vessel into four categories. First is physical, social, organizational, and individual. As far as the physical, the meaning of physical is the physical uh, structure of the ship condition of the ship, hygiene and food quality on the ship. If the quality of the ship, if the condition of the ship is good, certainly the claims will be lower. If the hygiene, food quality is good, illness will be lower. But these factors are again, many of the ship owners are not taking care of. The food quality, I have seen many places, the crew are complaining about the food quality and it is to be ensured that the quality of food these people get, the hygiene which is kept on the ships are of good standards. As far as the social environmental factor is concerned, it is relating to age and nationality complement of the crew. The age, if there is a wide variation between the crew complement, there are problems because there is uh, people tend to remain in isolation, there is no social gathering <coughs> taking place. National complement also, if there is a multi multi of the nationality of the people, again people tend to remain in isolation which affects the mental well-being of the people. Organizational environment, of course hierarchy existing within the ships and hierarchy which is at the base level. We have seen that the many, there are many shipping companies where the lower category of the people are not allowed to meet the master or the chief engineer which should be discouraged actually. If there is any problem taking place on the ship, the crew members, the ratings should be allowed to approach the master or the chief engineer without any hesitation. Or if there is a problem, the captain or the chief engineer also should be allowed to uh, reach the superintendent at the base level, which is generally happening but in many shipping companies this is a big problem. Working hours, of course, everybody knows what happens actually. People are not uh, able to take rest. They are supposed to work four hours, they are supposed to take rest, which is again to be considered because if the person is required more rest, if he is ill, we have to take care of such people also. Individual environment, of course, nature of individual, the habits of the individual, the family issues, if he is facing any family problems, they have to be particularly looked into and sorted out. In fact, as far as the family issues are concerned, six months back again we have one case, a person was missing that he was a uh, chief cook on the boat vessel and he used to have a lot of uh, family issues. That's what was discovered after the person went missing actually. He used to get calls, he used to keep on shouting over the phone many times. This used to happen, this happened for the last two, three months before the person got missing on board actually. So such kind of things also must be pointed out and discussed with the seniors. What are the remedies available? <coughs> These are the remedies which are of course being taken place. This will be discussed of course in the panel discussions, but I have just briefly mentioned here the pre-employment medical programs. Of course, Many of the PNI clubs have started enhanced the pre employment medical programs which are being implemented for the Ukraine crew, for the Filipino crew and even for the Indian crew also. So basically the main aim of these PME programs are to ensure that the crew members are reasonably fit to undergo the seagoing activities. <coughs> Generally what has happened because we have seen in the olden days of course when I used to do handle these crew clans in the younger days, people used to go on board and the, if they have got any helmets, the helmets used to get hidden, they were never disclosed. And people used to go on the board to get the treatment. So this kind of thing should be avoided. Nowadays with the enhanced PME schemes, I think we are able to find out any illnesses and we are encouraging that such people are not sent on board. Such things are basically happening for the kidney stones issues of course. People are hiding such kind of issues and going on board. And if they found ill, then again we have to repatriate them in care extra expenses also. 24 by 7 support, telephone helpline. There are many companies which have come up, PNDAC was also taken 
interest in uh, introducing this kind of schemes. These schemes are available uh, through some uh, good uh, clinical psychologists and they are available in multiple languages of course. If a person cannot talk English, he can talk in his local language and get the advantage, get the medical guide from this 24 by 7 medical helplines. Now, support system on the vessel. This is the GAR club had carried out the surveys and they have found out though this PME or the 24 by helpline lines are available, the support system on the vessel because the people are traveling on board, they don't have access, physical access to any other, anyone else. So what the GAR club survey has suggested, if the, there are issues on board, the person who is suffering should be allowed to talk to his colleagues. We should discuss his problems with the colleagues because you tend to discuss your problems with the known people rather than the unknown people. So they have suggested that you must have a frequent social gathering on board the vessels. So this is definitely improved on the vessels which are entered with the guard club. Now as far as the guard club is concerned, of course we are not trying to market this particular product on behalf of guard club. But this, this product is available at free of cost. That is why we have introduced this product on this presentation here. The product's name is Mariner's Medico Guide, which is uh, developed by GAR and, and, and a Norwegian Institute for Medicines. So this product is available free of cost. Anybody can download on their mobiles and they can use it even offline also. Anywhere, in any even in the on the ships where you don't have any access because this is this can be downloaded offline and can be utilized. So this is a very good product that's what this is a terrible product and all kinds of medical help is available on this particular guide. So this is the in brief what is the what are the current trends as far as the crew claims are concerned. Of course the claims there is no in, reduction in the claims. Claims if you have, when we have seen for the last five years, claims there has been an increasing trend only in the crew claims. Of course, the ship owners, the PNI clubs, the marine medical doctors, psychologists, everybody is assisting this particular uh, fraternity of the seafarers. But it is also the responsibility of the seafarers also to take care of their health physically and mentally. Because unless the seafarers themselves take care of themselves, the chances of reduction in the crew claims is minimal. So, and then seafarers must, there are very few seafarers here in the room, but the seafarers must remember that their physical and mental health is directly proportional to their career. If the health is better, they can work longer on the ships. So, that message is given to the seafarers definitely. Now, I will request uh, further panel discussions only. This is as far as the train claims for the medical sensor. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pradeep Kulkarni, for giving that those details and all the data. And uh, uh, thank you for bringing in that point that uh, insurance companies should now consider mental health uh, parity along with physical health uh, as well. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll have you join back again with us on stage. Thank you. Yes. Uh, may I now call upon uh, our panelist uh, uh, ahead for taking the, uh, taking up the discussion, uh, Dr. Dipti Mankar, please, can I have you on stage? She's a wellness coach, founder and director of MindSpeak. Uh, Mr. Ravjot Khuman, founder and director, 3Q Medicare Private Limited. Sir, can we have you on stage? Mr. Manish Pradhan, Managing Director, Global Drive Fleet, Synergy Marine Group. Dr. Jacob Matthew, Chairman and Managing Director, Seabird Medicare Group. Welcome, sir. Captain Tushar Pradhan, General Secretary, the Maritime Union of India. Dr. B. Z. Bilani, Medical Director, Dr. Bellani's Blue Shield Medical Clinic. Welcome, sir. May we have a moderator for this panel, Mr. Adrian Stray, 
CEO and Managing Partner, Stray Partners AS. Welcome, sir. So just a small reminder, your timer is set there. Q&A would be uh, through the Slido app, so please uh, put in your questions so that we can pass it on to our moderators. Thank you. Well, it's not morning any longer, it's afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Or good afternoon, I mean. <laughs> good seeing you, uh, and I hope you're well. Uh, on Friday, we had a Zoom meeting with this panelist. I'm just a rubble today. These are the stars. Um, and I could just sit listening. Not just do they have like more than 100 years of sailing experience, but they do have uh, good skills. And not maybe most, the most important thing, they have the heart. They have the heart for people. And that is like the starting point of this thing. But well-being in maritime, Dr. Ditti, mind speak. Taste the word mind speak. What the mind is speaking. Dr. Ditti, give us a definition of your perspective of well-being as a start. Thank you, Adrian. So if I have to put well-being, a couple of points. First, well-being means you're happy. Two, you're content with what you're doing. Three, you have a purpose for what you're doing something in life. You need to have a purpose. Without that, life is meaningless. And fourth, you have to have the ability to cope with stressors which surround us. So if someone says that uh, well-being means you are stress-free, that's wrong. We all have stressors, each one sitting here. But if we have the ability and we learn how to cope with it, and we are balanced in life, then I think we are all in a state of well-being. Thank you. I like the word purpose there. Sorry. She, she should have an applause. She should have. Sorry. But the purpose is an important thing, right? The purpose. The purpose of being on scene. We have split the discussion in two. The first part will be the world as it is. The second part, and maybe more the fun part, will be how we would like it to be. How do we navigate for a better future? The first part, we have questions. The second part, we have no questions. This will be a daisy discussion with life, with passion. He, here, Synergy Group will be the one kicking it off. He had so much passion here earlier, which will be fun. Um, but a story about purpose first, before we will start talking about claims and, and how we root cause claims. This is from the UK. And this is about well-being. Every two years, no, every, every decade, the life expectancy grow by two years. This is through 1900, so from 1900 to 1910, life expectancy grew two years. So every decade it grows, except two decades, 1910 to 1920, and 1940 to 1950. What happened? World War, right? Suddenly people have a reason to, you know, work together. We heard the word collaborate. So it's kind of fascinating. Those two decades, from 10 to, to, to 20, and from 40 to 50. It grew between six to seven years. And it, they ate more healthy, they walked more, but the most important thing, they had a purpose for living. Well, we listen to uh, the hard facts from God, or from, from uh, Mr. Krukarni. Thank you, by the way. Um, and, and that's like the bottom of, of, what should I say, the claims. And then we work upwards, from downstreams to upstreams. And uh, we challenge now, come on, and to say, what is your perspective of this? Because you, you, I mean, you serve, you facilitate for the seafarers, and you avoid, try to avoid things from happening. 
but do your root cause analysis because he's good at it, please. Thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you, Max, for giving me this opportunity to be on a panel with such senior people uh, from whom we continue to learn on a daily basis and try and add to what value we can give to our seafarers. Uh, the claims presentation was excellent in the sense it actually gives us an idea of what's going on. And I think when I was sitting there and I was just looking at the data, it looks pretty much on track as to what we get to see. And I like the part where at the end they said this is all the claims that are recorded beyond ten to twelve thousand dollars. So we're only talking about probably those cases where a medical evacuation is required, uh, repatriation is required, or any special investigations or hospitalizations at port. We can't wish this away. Uh, that is the nature of seafaring, that there is some sense of uh, danger of fear when it comes to working. But that's when we talk about seafaring. If you look at what we see on land, there is growing number of illnesses, growing number of injuries, growing number of mental health concerns, even when we are sitting here on land. Seafarers are basically the same population, moving from one challenging environment on land to an even more challenging environment on the vessels. So since I have to curtail and talk on, you know, specifically about claims, just giving the background, I think What's important to understand from a claims perspective and the ones below the ten to twelve thousand dollars, which are primarily port visits or lesser intense medical injuries or illnesses, is to understand the merit of the medical incident, the response to that medical incident. These two will define eventually what happens from it. So if you have a medical event which you have a specialist or you have a, uh, somebody who can deal with that quickly and prevent something from becoming into a medical claim, then that's great. Then you're able to provide that service. That's what adds value, not only from an economic perspective for the company, but more so for the confidence of the seafarer. That he, he or she knows that they have access to kind of care which is available readily. There was, of course, there is a lot of talk about whether internet on board is good or bad. I think, we, again, we can't wish it away. Technology is coming in, internet access on board will increase. From a medical perspective, it's extremely helpful and useful in a lot of cases. I think a lot of cases are able to be managed primarily because of better connectivity. But on the other side, I think there should be some level of training or awareness of how to cope with excessive communication because of social media. That is a separate topic on its own, which I'm not going to get into at this point. So, Merit of a medical incident, response to that medical incident will determine the outcome of it. What are the reasons why we are seeing claims, they, I mean we saw medical claims being stagnated at about almost the same compared to the others. That's primarily, if you look at it from an industry perspective versus the world perspective, it's probably a good statistic. Because if you look at what's been happening on land in terms of mental health disorders increasing, is a lot more. But again, what can we do to decrease that? And that's part of the second part of the conversation, so I won't go into it. There are a lot of initiatives that are there that should be done. When it comes to injuries and illnesses, I think, uh, again, there's the pre-employment part, there is when they are on board, there is factors on board that was presented. All those factors do come into play, but most importantly, I think it is to make sure that when there is a medical event, can they have immediate direct access to assistance, which is focusing on making sure they recover quickly, rather than you need to go here, you need to go there. And I think that's where we say root cause as to why these claims are you know, decreasing we saw in some years, is because that access to care is increasing, the access to specialists are increasing, the medicines on board are getting better. So I think it's, it's a transition. I think yesterday's discussion was just transition. It's, it's part of that transition. And in that, we are going to see some you know, odd curveballs. Somebody has uh, incorporated and got good medicines, good facilities on board, and some of them are still far behind. So when you take the average, you may not see much of a change. Uh, but I think with guards, some statistics showing decrease in certain claims probably could be because of the increase in deductible. But I think increase in deductible is also giving the 
is, in, is indicative that the companies are confident of the kind of care to reduce those claims between that 10 and 12,000. So it, it depends on the perspective you want to look at, but I'll leave it at that because otherwise it's a very long topic and I'm seeing the time go down and down. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. For those not seeing here, but there's a clock there, so we're seeing it counting down, so thank you, you were spot on. Uh, and insurance is exciting, and what you're doing is exciting, thank you. We're still on the operational side, and we're moving one level up, and we're coming here to um, Manesh Pradhan in Synergy Group. So he, he lives and he breathes the life of 22,000 seafarers or 23,000 seafarers, 620 vessels. I mean, he lives it. It's not just numbers. You live this passion every day. Um, how do you tackle well-being? How do you prepare people for well-being uh, for a life at sea? That's the first part of the question. You will also get a second question. Does well-being among crew seafarers affect brand value? of your corporation, because that's the purpose of the business. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Marix, uh, for this opportunity to be on this elite panel. Um, so since you addressed it to Synergy, I will start with Synergy. Uh, Synergy has been one of the fastest growing companies uh, in terms of ship management, uh, which basically forced us into dealing with more and more people. Uh, and we've uh, the most unique part of our growth has been that we've grown more in the COVID times. So if we go back, we've taken over 300 ships in the last three years, which has been uh, an extremely uh, kind of fast evolving journey. Now, when the company is going so fast, you have to keep pace with the times and you have to keep evolving. I mean, it's, it's not, you don't have the opportunity to go at your own pace. You have to go at the pace of how we are growing. So the, it starts from our chairman, Captain Rajesh Unni, who is known in the industry for being one of the most empathetic people in the business. And he actually lives the core value of the company, which is empathy. It starts from him. It comes down to the founder members. If you meet these people, they're probably one of the most humble and simple people in the business. And we drive our inspiration from there. So pre-COVID times, uh, mental wellness was always, had already gone into discussion, uh, pretty late in the industry, but still. Uh, we started something called iCall, which was in, in partnership with a company called uh, Tata Consultancy Services. The idea was to learn the ropes from very, very professional self. And that was more focused at uh, the Indian seafarers, which was, uh, that was the larger content at that time. As we grew exponentially, we then moved on to something called V-Team, where we have engaged agencies from outside India, and it's a conglomerate of specialists who can approach, uh, I mean, the idea was to go to all nationalities, because with growth came uh, diversity in the fleet. We had people from different countries stepping in. And uh, the V-Team was basically into engaging, we had a toll-free number, and we had a lot of calls coming into this team basically to discuss their problems. That was stage two. Then we realized that one is, you know, always just engaging and, you know, hearing the problems and solving it only when somebody owned up to it. And I can tell you there is still a lot of apprehension in people agreeing or accepting that I have a well-being issue or I'm not feeling good. People do not want to admit to it. So then came stage three, which we launched very recently, which we tied up with this uh, very, very professional company called Mana Wellness. And they have a huge and professional group of, uh, of counselors who not just, we are not just engaging with people who are having problems, we're starting to train people when they are on leave. We call them well-being champions. So we get people into, the, in our, into our training rooms, we have uh, virtual uh, kind of trainings. And we are preparing well-being champions who are going to spread the methodology of working together on a ship. Because what we realize is there could be ships where um, you have three generations working together. You could have a very, very senior master chief engineer, a mid-level guy, the master chief engineer could be approaching his 60s, mid-level at about 40s. And then you have the training cadet who's just you know, seeing his first ship 
And we somehow noticed that it was, unless the three generations can work in tandem, it's not working out to be a winning formula. And if you go by the statistics and you see the, the problem area is more the first timers or the, or the very young minds who get on board who actually have a different dream and when they go on board they see a different, it is not as per what they thought and that's when things start to go wrong. So the idea was to train every level. So we're making these well-being champions and Mana Wellness has been uh, doing really well on that. So the key three areas that Synergy is now concentrating on is first is, first is active listening. We want to listen. Uh, the general trends, uh, not just shipping, but we, we like to talk more, but we just try to listen in and understand what are the, those core issues. Where can we keep evolving our training or you know, how can Mana Wellness have more database of what the core issues are. The second part we are addressing is the family welfare. What we've realized that if the family is happy and safe at home, the seafarer is happy and safe. Because there's less, you know, rolling up to him, less problems rolling up to him, he's able to concentrate on his work. Otherwise, he feels pretty helpless on board. And the third part is the well-being on board, where we have a mechanism of, a, uh, we have a lot of debriefing and, uh, you know, we have apps where we get uh, live feedback from the ships. So the idea is get the live scenario on board and then we can use our shore teams to connect and correct that. So we are, this is the three-pronged approach that we are taking, listening, family, and onboard welfare. So that's from the synergy aspect. I like that one. But I, I have to have you just ask the second part of the question. Sorry. Why is it important for synergy to do it that way? Very simple. Happy seafarers, content seafarers is basically the main thing is I'm not talking I'm not talking money here. Of course you're going to have more success, lesser accidents, lesser downtimes when the performance is higher. But for us in Synergy, the main thing about why we want our seafarers to be happy and have a good well being is we want to retain top talent. We want to attract top talent. So when this comes together, the numbers will turn black. That's that's the obvious. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we see the clock is ticking down, so we just move slowly over to one of your points here, and that was about the family. Here we have Mr. Tushar, huh? and you've been, you've been sailing for a life, and now you have stepped out, going on the other side into the union, and you take care of the officers, their families, just what you said, family matters, huh? Uh, and the further in distance in time, and in distance away from the family, well-being going down. Tusha, talk us a little bit about family and, you know, the biggest challenges there. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Marex, for this opportunity. I've been very fortunate to wear both the hats. One as a master, where I have paramount authority and at my discretion to deliver what the owners requested and also at the same time to make sure that work was done in a safe manner and it was result oriented, kept my staff happy, make sure there were no injuries, could motivate them, have a lot of cultural activities on board for their well-being and that is one way that you keep your family happy. It was quite simple and easy for me to do because I was only handling about 24 to 25 people at a time. Now wearing my second hat in my second innings with the Maritime Union of India, I have a lot more responsibility. I didn't think this job was very so simple or so easy initially, but I've been enjoying this and I find that if you have a way, you can manage to do things to a larger extent. Only thing you need the entire industry support. It cannot be done by one man or just by a small team in the office. We have a wonderful industry who is always cooperative, who is always willfully giving me the suggestions. And I keep my heart open for them. No matter what you have been, today I am a different personality. I have, I have the entire responsibility for the officers of this maritime in industry. 
We have about over 40,000 officers as our members. And I have to ensure that as much as possible, I satisfy their needs. The biggest trouble for me and the hardships that I face is now the decision is not left in my hands. I have to knock on the doors of the authorities. And it is they who decide to take the shots. So those are the hardships that I'm facing, but the trust that I have from these officers persuades me to go after these authorities, keep knocking on their doors to get the results as early as possible. Because if the seafarer is not happy, their families are not going to be happy. And what is well-being? Well-being, the part of the well-being is the stress. If you can take that stress away of the seafarer and look after their families, I think everything is a well-being. So, main thing is the connectivity that is very important with the family for a seafarer. The rest hours, because if he is not properly rested, because every ship has a different work culture, there are all hours of work that you have to put in and you have to adjust yourself. But if you are mentally not rested, you are bound to have issues like there will be a lot of calamities, there are going to be a lot of accidents on board, then you are not properly eating, your nutrition is not proper, you are going to face problems. So all these factors are there. Also, the extension of contracts on board causes a lot more stress and that is not well-being because then no one is happy. Well, as Captain Manish mentioned, money is not everything. Yes, the longer you stay, we say always is to say, oh, your contract is accepted, so you should be happy, you are going to earn one, some more dollars. More money, the better it is for your family. But that's not the end. The family has certain needs. The seafarer has certain needs. There are some physical needs also. He has to be there at the right time. They have done their own planning. For us, it is main thing is to reach to their families. The, with the officers, it is very simple. It's we are there on the email, WhatsApp, Facebook. So we get connected to each other on a day-to-day -day basis. But for us to reach for the families, we first have to see the culture. We have to see the national or uh, the religion and then designate people accordingly to go over, talk to them, understand what they need and see how we can accommodate them. There are a lot of finances involved in all to this. As far as possible, I try to do the best. But the best is never enough. It has to come from everyone. So if all the seafarers are supportive, the industry supports them, I think we can be wonderful. We can be on par with anybody, we can have more and more seafarers and create our younger generations to join and I still feel we are still falling short of motivating people to come more out at sea or to those who are on board asking them, today if you go to their houses and you ask, will you, that, will you give your daughter to a seafarer? the first answer will be no. Nobody wants a seafarer anymore in their family. Gone are the days where everybody looked at the seafarer very proudly. I think you will partially at least agree with me. So this is something which we need to work on. And we have to ensure that we have proper gyms on board. I wonder if you could put yoga on the list. Why is it that our companies are falling short of making yoga as a permanent program on board. That is one of the brighter way of de-stressing yourself. You have yoga, you have meditation, you name it, you can do that. And you should have a proper evaluation of every member on board. So if you can do that, you will have Less claims, I think Mr. Kulkani will be very happy. And also the owners, the insurers, and we can have a very happy family. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. So there is something about happy wife and happy life, huh? There is something about it, uh, even in these days, huh? Uh, 
shifting a little bit avenue now. We're going more on the medical side. And uh, the first doctor here, uh, Dr. Jacob here, uh, submarine, 40 days from the uh, Vostok to India in a submarine. Try it for those who want. I would not, with a little bit of <coughs> claustrophobia. Um, two questions to you. The PEMA standards, or PEMA, or pre-C screening. Your point of view of that. And the second will be, when you look at the PNI cases, or the repatriation cases, and you try to look at them both ways. This will, question will also be passed on to Belani later, a doctor on the other side. So you start first, then we go over to the second one, okay? Thank you, Adrian. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the question is of the medical standards of people who are coming on board the vessels. Just quickly go back. Uh, I had two careers, one in the military service. I retired as a surgeon commander of the Indian Navy, working on board the submarines and with the elite force, the marine commandos. I did 13 years with the submarines and seven years with the marine commandos. The standards that we had of physical fitness was one of the best in the country. The best soldiers come from these two elite forces. When I came and made a transition from the military to the Merchant Navy in uh, 25 years ago, I found the standards per se on paper was the same. So what was written on the paper was the same. But what we found was there was a lot of X factor. The standards were first laid out in 1921 when they have the International Labor Organization conferences and then it was revised in 1946 and then it came back to 1973 and then when I came in and started working what we had was the medical examinations 2000. So these standards which were put unfortunately the regulator I don't think they are really present right now here they never laid out what these standards would be for selection except in a very vague manner. So today I think we have got 165 institutes who are bringing in the seafarers into the marine industry and I think we have got 165 different standards for medical examination, the PME. Every institute, every company in this industry has got their own standards. The, the basic standard which is laid out is fine, but what constitutes these have never been defined by the authorities. So we have a case where somebody who's done his full course, the course is the same, the course syllabus is the same. He finishes his uh, uh, complete training and he comes to me and I find that he doesn't have a kidney because the institute never insisted on uh, ultrasonography. You can have one kidney and you could be working just normally, everything could be normal. You could have a person with a strong psychiatric history being treated and yet not putting it down when he joined and then there was no assessment done. I don't think even 10% of the institutes who recruit the people on board the ships have any mental awareness check and probably Dipti would be able to uh, substantiate what I am saying. 
So, if you do not have proper standards for recruiting the people, the finished products is going to be very, very poor. And so also, now let's come down, this is the pre-C part. You come down to the PME part. That's your periodic medical examination. Again, I work with 40 odd, 50 companies. Every company has got its own standards. And the companies who have the best standards, and I got a lot of MDs sitting here with whom I'm working, there would be the companies who insist on highest standards who would have probably one to two repatriations in three months to companies who lower the standards and then I have a repatriation of two to three a day. And that's where Mr. Kulkarni gets those high statistics. So, again, without naming the company, I have companies who told me, Doctor, we will not interfere in your selection or clearance of medicals. They will not get a single call from my office. And you do your job. What you give me will be the product I take. But if he comes back for an ailment, then teri peshi ho jayegi. You will have to come and give an explanation as to why he has come back. And I can assure you, the companies who took the highest standards practically have no repatriations. Kulkarni would be happy because uh, you know, his claims are going to be low. But the companies who lowered the standards would be the one who would be causing the maximum claims. So this is, the entire thing is what product you send on board if he is a finished product, you will have no repatriations. The moment you lower it, you are going to have lots and lots of repatriations. It is interesting. And when each case is like $15,000? Yes. The money is starting to, well, though this insurance company paying, but you pay the premium. Well, uh, Dr. Bellani. I also forward it to you, but I would also like you to compare it with some other industries. You know, the, the treatment illnesses coming from like pilots or executives into your clinics. If there is a difference, okay? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Merex, and uh, thank you for having me on the panel here. And Adrian, thank you for your question. Uh, but before I just move in, uh, just what uh, Jacob said, an extension. Uh, why do we lower the standards? The companies are looking at L1, so those are the costs. So every ship manager, ship owner uh, wants the most economical way to go forward and uh, save money. So save money at what cost is what everybody probably will have to put their mind in. Uh, the difference in, uh, when I see some of my uh, patients or those executives whom we do an annual checkup ashore and are going to work ashore have the luxury of time, have the luxury of reference to a huge uh, laboratory assessment or an imaging assessment. When I'm doing seafarers, the typical ailments arise from their occupation standing for a long time. So varicose veins, hemorrhoids, very common, hernia. Uh, I, I must make a fair decision in a short time based on a very small scope of tests and cannot extend unless the employer gives me an approval to go beyond. But as I said, L1 or saving on costs. So we have to then use our clinical judgment drawn from our huge years of experience. So there's a big challenge. When I'm looking for somebody ashore, I have the luxury of time. I know if I do not make a fair decision for a seafarer, I may deprive him a family of a very fruitful employment. Uh, so these are some challenges that I face. Of course, when I'm doing a PME, I know 
the objective is to screen out pre-existing medical diseases so that we reduce the volume and value of claims. I mean, we saw what uh, Mr. Kulkarni put up for guard. Uh, I have 13 days of sailing time, uh, which is very short, but for a doctor, I think it's good enough. When I sailed on vessel SCI 1983, there were 52 people on board. Today, averagely, we have 22, 23. So one seafarer falling sick on board, the workload is shared, can endanger the safety and life of others. So how do we look at that? We must have stringent standards for PEMI, as uh, Jacob has already emphasized. Uh, there, there are so many safety features now. When I first issued a medical certificate, in an A4 sheet, I could do six certificates. Uh, there was, there's no scope of medical examination, which uh, Jacob has also said, which is outlined by any regulator so far. Every employer chooses to have their own scope of test, their own PEMI standards, their own profile. So we do not have a standard. There, so these are some of the challenges that we face. And uh, whereas those seafarers, when I say that you're not fit, we need to evaluate further they always want to conceal their medical history because there is a, a lucrative job that we are looking at. An executive who is assured says, I am assured of my employment. Yes, what else do I have to do? So there is a huge difference, huge gap between the two. The approach, the attitude is so different. Just a comment to your comments. <laughs> <laughs> Michigan and Ohio universities in the 50s looked upon two types of companies, those who focus on P&L or the cost first or the money or those focusing on people. In the long run, those focusing on people first outperform the other company types by far. Um, thank you. Saving the best for the last in the first round. But before I close, I want to say what Mr. Kulkarni said in his prelude. Uh, mental, social and emotional well-being. Uh, when I was a medical student, I was reading the WHO definition of good health. First coined on April 1, 1948, still stands true. Amazingly, it doesn't change because it says good health is a state of well, social, mental and emotional well-being and not merely an absence of physical infirmity. So true today. I didn't understand this when I was a medical student, the value of this definition. Ah, will do, will do. Three questions, huh? Thank you. Uh, then I should have the other glasses, but that's another thing. <laughs> Saving the best for the last, huh? Dr. Dipti, uh, we're complex human beings, huh? 86 billion neurons or something. Uh, you listen to the seafarers, you counsel them what's on their mind or what's in their heart, to put it this way. Talk us through. Yes, I've been listening to everyone here and uh, yeah, this is very close to my heart. And just to take off from where Dr. Balani was saying, it depends on the attitude of the company people. Just to share an example without naming any companies, I remember I got a call and they said the cadet is just about to join the vessel, his tickets have come, he's come with his luggage. He's had a full night uh, train journey, he's not eaten anything. We have done his test here, but it's coming on borderline. I said, what do you mean by borderline? Yeah, so we just need you to just speak to him, counsel him and tell us if he's fine to join. I said, when is his joining? He has a flight to take tonight. I was like, so, I said, but you're saying he's not clear. No, he's just borderline. And he kept on repeating the person who I was talking to, it's a borderline case. Now, first of all, for me to understand what do you mean by a borderline case, if I ask you all in the audience, what is borderline for you? Will you send the person or will you not send the person? Borderline. What is borderline? Huh? Yeah, so if it's borderline, what would you interpret? I want somebody else to certify. Huh? Ah. So, when things like this happen, we all, I also have to sit back and think that 
how are we administering these tests? Every company has its own. Everybody does a psychometric test, everybody does that. But you have to understand when are you doing it for the person. You have asked that cadet to travel a 14 hour journey in a train. He's reached your company, he's not eaten his breakfast, he's anxious because he was told to join on a very short notice. And he's anyways having anxiety. He is uh, a bit stressed that he has to join the vessel. And then you're giving him a psychological test to do. Is it fair? I don't think so. Many companies do a psychometric test. They call the people in the office and they're sitting in the AC room. Nice, they've been given a console. So you're sitting and doing your test. How are you interpreting that environment with someone who's rushed into and So yes, there's a difference in how you administer tests and what results come out of it. Coming to Adrian's question, of course, counseling. Yes, uh, no matter how virtual we get in today's life, but this is my take and it's only my opinion. So anything you have, please hold it against me only. That I feel you cannot replace a human touch with virtual medium. Yes, you can use a virtual medium to get through a person, to talk or to kind of, you know, speak to the person, do a video call. But the face-to-face -face interaction when you have with the person, because it's very important the person who's talking to you feels that you are listening to the person, you have an empathetic approach towards the person, you're sensitive towards the person, and which may also sometimes require just holding the hand of the person. The person might just break down. Earlier times, if you remember, there are so many seniors here, you could possibly even go put your hand around your cadet or your junior and say, don't worry, you know, just we are there, it's fine, we are going to get through it. Can you do that on a virtual medium? Sending an emoji on WhatsApp with a heart and, you know, you're not even feeling anything, but you're just sending it. What emotion is attached to it? Nothing. So when we, when I remember in COVID time, a lot of seafarers I've spoken to, even in person I've met so many of them and we sit and talk for hours at time. It's very important that they are able to talk their heart out without judging them as how can you feel in this manner. You're the captain. Now we are talking about pre-entry levels and all, but just to bring to your notice, there are a lot of senior officers who have had major breakdowns during COVID. They've had blackouts, they have wanting to resign, want to go back home. They don't feel they're you know, able to cope with that stress. But I think age is also a factor. As we progress in age, what you used to be as a ferocious young 25, 30 year old sailing bachelor life on board, and now you're crossing 50, 55, you have a family, definitely that pressure and handling that pressure on board does definitely get affected with age. So it's not that only the youngsters feel, maybe the youngsters feel performance anxiety, but when you're at the level where today the masters, though they say you have the, what, what do you say, overriding authority, but I don't think that's the case today. So their stress levels are very different the way they face it. Having said that, we do have seniors who are brilliant on board, who feel though we are passionate about it, stress is anyways there, but they have learned how to cope with it. So again, I'm repeating it. When we counsel, we are not telling them what they should do, what they should not do. Rather, they have to come up with what they are feeling and we are just guiding them to, all right, now this is the stress, it's not going to go away. So how do you want to deal with it? How do you cope with it? So coping mechanisms, giving our seafarers coping mechanisms is extremely important because when the thing happens on board, it is going to take time for the company to respond. It is going to take time for a counselor to come in. It is going to take time for them to set in and set a you know, platform where the person will be able to talk. So the only 22, 23 people on board are there, which is again, I say, if you take them as family, you have amongst those 23 people, you'll have someone who can do brilliant counseling for the person who's on ship. So I think it's very important that uh, we talk about skills in training here. Apart from all technical training, I feel human skill trainings should also be given priority. Empathy, very important. 
how do you have basic counseling skills anybody can do you don't need to be a psychologist for that you don't need to be a psychiatrist for that you need to be a person with a good heart receptive and empathy anybody here can become a counselor anybody here without a certificate but you need to have that heart to do it thank you well said dr dipti huh i like it you have the passion for it uh and yes people can go through stress i mean horrible i mean even if you have like the demands in uh, the job is high you have little control but if you have the support from your superior or support from people you can go through fire or water or whatever thing we have got three questions good questions i think we need uh, at least 6 7 minutes for it now we shifting gear to speak the free heart it will be a little bit shorter because uh, the, the, the i know the time is ticking pradhan i like to hear your heart out on way ahead for what we spoke about and you were freely you can even stand if you like if you feel more free way to go thanks edwin so yeah i've been just making some quick notes about uh, the second part which is actually one is where we are and one is where we want to get to you know to get into a better space uh first thing is that we need to start recognizing the problem uh we get into these big conferences the recognition is fine the implementation is low now talking of some small things uh, dr deepthi and the others spoke about psychometric analysis how many of us are looking at deep diving into the psychometric analysis and identifying the weak areas and training according to that uh most of us in shipping are still into one size fits all there are fixed set of courses this is what you get to do uh if you there are some fantastic psychometric tools which can actually identify very accurately where are your strengths and where are your weaknesses how about deep diving and explaining to the seafarer spending a one on one session on how he can power his strengths more and cover his weaknesses so basically going ahead we would like to get into that space where we come out of this mandatory training thing and get into a skill enhancement training whether it is a soft skill or a hard skill i mean we are still into the same space where you have to do btm every 5 years I mean, the masters are navigating the ships in and out of port every day. What do you want him to do with another 40-hour BTM? I would rather, you know, get the, the 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 regulators to think on what is it, what's new, what can I give him in a bite-sized learning, rather than a five-day classroom embedded course. So that's one. Uh, second is, what is the experience that my seafarer is having? is becoming commodity where everybody is just trying to fish on him offer him what's the previous offer more 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 and then just get on board what after that are we paying attention to the onboarding experience to start with on board experience and off signing experience i think there's a huge scope to develop our way on that i mean simple thing like we cap the victory eight dollars eight and a half dollars somebody would say nine dollars how many of us are following it over here have we i mean i was saying 20 years back i think victory was probably six dollars so in 20 years we've come to eight eight and a half where has the inflation gone post covid where has the where have the prices gone say if you're picking up provisions in japan or europe is somebody putting a thought into it why am i capping the food of a guy who is running my ship worth 50 million dollars asset value is that high cargo value might be more than that but i tell him you are only allowed 8 8 and a half 9 dollars of food i mean do you think somebody can actually go and eat lobsters every day somebody can eat this food in this five star hotel every day it's just about the mindset the thought process and these are my best guys they run my business not that even synergy is doing it but this is an appeal to the people who set the standards 
as a management company, yes, our hands are tied. But I want this thought to go forward and say, yes, let's respect these guys. When they're onboarding, let's put them in, let's treat them like the pilots. Give them a green carpet uh, immigration channel. Let them feel important. And then if we are complaining that we don't have, as Captain Pradhan said, we don't have our children wanting to come to see is because of this. We are not glamorous enough. Then we step into the social media zone, taking from where Ravjot left is. We, we must have internet. We can't say what we can't handle, we cut off. We have to have internet. It helps him with his medicals. But the other side to it is, how are we training our boys or how are we spreading that culture of what to post on the internet, what to like, what not to like. I, I, I bet uh, that I think we see more negative about shipping on, on social media than positive. I, I have I'm yet to see somebody posting pictures of uh, rescues done at sea. That our ship went and rescued this guy and I would love to see thousands of likes on that. I instead see somebody who had an accident, there's an oil pollution, this company did that, this company did this. Come on. That's not going to attract people into shipping. And that's, all this is leading to kind of depressions on board. I mean, today's morning uh, newspaper has 23 suicides in the city of Kota of aspiring students. We've had suicides in the IITs, which is the leading uh, institution in our country. We're better than that. But then we need to progress into that space where we take pride of what we do. And the companies take pride. So in short, I want to go from the space of paying salary to seafarers and transition into paying attention to seafarers. Let's pay attention to them. Let's see things. I guess you always say, agreeing to that, huh? Uh, we see the clock still ticking. But I have one question to you. No, not the question. I would like you to tell your story about the bullet. Army, take the bullet. And, uh, you talked about it earlier today. Yeah. Yes. Again, I am I'm talking like a soldier. When uh, we were discussing people coming to join the marine industry. And it's fairly well paid. Let me tell you, because I have been on both sides. When a soldier has to be recruited anywhere in the country, and there's one vacancy, there would be at least a thousand people volunteering to join. And it set me thinking when I started working in the second part of my career in this industry. And I saw that when a soldier is recruited, he's willing to get a bullet in his heart. And yet, there are a thousand applicants for one vacancy. And what we do in the recruiting centers is that we tell them, you can see a tree in front of you, all of you start running, and then they put a rope and the guys who made it in the first 10 seconds or 20 seconds, you know, they drop and say, hey, remaining is out. That's how they recruit from the thousand volunteers for one post. Here we come now to our industry. We take, we are looking for volunteers. There's nobody from any of the metros. And you're not badly paid. So what I feel is that you're not giving a complete package to them. That is where you give them a security, a feeling of being wanted. They are being used and they are a contract labor. And that's the unfortunate thing. I don't think they have an organized way of social security. I think uh, Captain Pradhan must be, uh, you know, working very hard over time. He's just joined, uh, taken over recently. But you've got to have a social security for each one of the people so that when he goes to sea and he comes back, he's sure 
that the industry will take care of him. And I think that is what is today missing. I'm sure you will also get 1,000 people to come for that one post. If you make this as a priority and you tell the entire industry that you please come down and stand with your brethren. I think, yes, please. Thank you. We have five more minutes. Belani, first, Dr. Ditti, Dushar. One minute impromptu. Oh, 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 oh. I'll have you out here also. One minute each, sorry, because I had you here on that question. That's why. Um, one minute impromptu. Your way of navigating the future to even better. One minute. Structured and regulated uh, medical examinations and healthcare for seafarers. We don't have any structured uh, document. Uh, the regulators have not put in a minimum scope. Uh, so if there is uh, a mining agent or a ship owner wants to save money, they want to apply the minimum standards. So the minimum standards have to be better than what they are today. So that's the way forward. I fully echo that one. Dr. Titi. So you said a minute, but I once. <laughs> Because so many industry people are here, so quickly, I will not take more than a minute, but I have to mention this because we are talking about way ahead and that's what uh, made us do a survey last year and in fact I was speaking to G DG sir yesterday also. It was initiated and started by uh, the support of uh, former DG, Mr. Amitabh Kumar. Many companies are here who very proactively took part in the survey. And because I felt uh, there was a need for it, there was no survey in India done to find out the mental health awareness. And we did it in three tiers. We collected data from pre sea cadets, we collected data from sailing staff, and we collected data from shore staff. So I'm not going to, the report is going to get completed by the end of the month, which will be out for all of you to see it for self. But just to tell you, overall, when we collected data, it was we have collected data for over 2,500 uh, sample size, and the level of awareness overall we got was very low level awareness came to 33 percent, low level of awareness came to 40 percent, moderate level was 25 percent, and good level was only 2 percent. All right, and all the major players of the industry here have participated in the survey, and the pre-C training figures were even more alarming. The cadets, 41% showed very low level of awareness, 43% had low level of awareness, 15% moderate and 1% good level. Of course, the report is bifurcated into sailing staff, uh, deck department, engine department. It's quite a comprehensive survey. The reason I got this out now was what can we do ahead? So firstly, if you're not aware of it, how are you going to do anything about it? So I feel firstly, in the pre-C level, we must make it as a compulsory subject, which should be introduced when we are talking about psychological health, mental health, because they are not aware of it. Second important thing here from the study, which I would like to highlight as all major players are here, there has to be a bridging between the shore staff as well as the sailing staff, because many of the companies who have HR people sitting in the office are not from the sailing background. So it's very important they understand about it so that they can be more active listeners when somebody is calling them from the vessel. They understand in what context is the sailor trying to speak to them. So that bridging of gap between shore staff and the people who are sailing is a very important aspect in well-being of people who are on, uh, you know, who are there. So obviously this study was a very big eye-opener for us and I think it's very important to understand we are talking about well-being. Let us start introducing subjects, focus more on empowering them through training, building up that understanding of mental health and well-being, providing psychological aid workshops so that we have champions like Sir was mentioning, you have well-being champions in your company so that they can support each other when they are on the vessel. And very important, everyone should be at the same page. Only then we can understand holistically when we are talking about well-being. Show staff people also require well-being. 
let me tell you, they have also gone through a lot of pressure. When I see some superintendents, my heart goes out to them also. They are always stressed and they are always working, even from home. So it's very important to find the balance between shore staff as well as sailing staff. Both require well-being, both require help, both need to be happy and content in what they are giving each other. Then only I think it will, you know, we are talking about actual well-being of the entire industry and not just seafarers. Thank you. Uh, thank you. 30 seconds for answering the question, 30 seconds in front of um, So with regard to, I mean, there's a question that says, has it been proved that people with better physical health have lesser mental health issues? If you look at seafaring, there is a general guideline of physical fitness. And I would say 90% of the seafarers fall within that guideline of physical fitness when I'm talking about, you know, general BMI, their functioning of organs, etc. But they still have mental health issues later on. It's the same population. I think sometimes we ask the question the other way around. Do people with good mental health have lesser physical health issues? And you see the perspective changes the moment you ask the question the other way around. Because we heard about the news, you know, young aspiring students committing suicide, mental health issues. Children who are eight, nine years old, were getting, were, or they were, there was a stream of suicides taking place. Uh, people working in offices, extremely fit, going to gyms in the morning and evening, having a very active social life, etc. Having mental health issues and then associated physiological issues as well. So the question is, with good health, I could have mental health disorders because in the environment that we live, stress is everywhere. We need to learn how to cope with that stress. We cannot wish it away. The engineer in me always says, you can't wish away. You, you're given a certain set of things you have to work within. So if you're given a construct or a framework, you need to see what is the best that you can do given that. Giving people room for some margin. If you see, you know, when they build bridges and all, they give that margin. Or when they're building buildings now with the earthquake prone areas, they're coming up with new designs to cope with it. But there is a framework. So, yes, I completely agree with Sir saying, you know, we cannot wish away that we, we want the sun and the moon, but we have to work with shipping is a cost constrained industry. We cannot suddenly say it's going to change. But what can we do within that? What each of us as stakeholders can do better than that? Even one effort. And so just to add to your point where you said structure, framework of pre employment medicals, I think also better unity and sharing of information. There will be a game changer the moment we start doing that. Keeping compliance and checks of data protection, which we discussed, which we won't get into here in this. But I think sharing of information, working with, collaborating instead of competing, will change the ball game. For Indian seafarers, we should not fall into the trap of Filipino seafarers with ambulance chasing, which is a huge issue, because we deal with the kind of cases we get, even with Filipino seafarers. So I just hope that we can do something when it comes to crew and well-being to prevent that becoming an access to an avenue Let's get off the ship today, let's create a medical event and let's, you know, milk the company in short if we can. So, just a small part of it. So, good people with good mental health have good physical health is my takeaway. Thank you. Sorry, overshot. Well, the boats re it time's up. But since I've been handed over, so the question out here is, what typical challenges long-serving master chief engineers face when they transition to shore jobs, how do companies support these individuals? Uh, there's a big transition for the ship staff when they come ashore. They are in a different environment. Initially, they still think about the seafarers and the jobs on board and they speak the same language. But then they find that they are at the receiving end from their superiors, from their bosses in the office. And if we have to survive, you have to dance to the tune of the CO and, and the wife. Yes, that's the, the main thing rather because no woman or no wife will like intrusion. See, they are the bosses at home when the sailors are at sea and when you come and tell them, no, I prefer to keep this plate in this place rather than in this place, nobody likes it. She doesn't like to have interference in her day-to-day -day affairs. They have their own social life by which she's been managing the home affairs. So that is the biggest challenge for the seafarers when they come ashore. When it comes to professionalism, I, I think they need a lot of mentoring. 
and as Dr. Deepthi said, a lot of HR in the offices have no seafaring experience. So mentoring is the biggest challenge because now they are not dealing with handful of officers or the crew which they were used to on board. Now they have to handle a sizable fleet of staff on board. And you have to respect. There is always that big word which starts with the alphabet E. Ego, we have to keep it aside when we come ashore to be very successful and make sure that your staff, your handling, those ships are very happy. So that is my take on this. Just to go off bit about wealthing, the biggest stress factor what I feel is also the finances for the seafarers. When they know they are serving, they lavishly spend and save peanuts. There are very few wise seafarers and neither their family are aware of the future and how much savings need to be done. The worst part is if something goes wrong, we always feel we will be surviving for a long time, nothing is going to happen to me and then we have issues. When the seafarer passes away, the family actually does not know what is left back. So, as an NUI, I was introduced just yesterday and it's a brilliant idea and I'm going to incorporate that as a program for in, through NUI is inheritance needs. You have to know what your ancestors have left for your parents, for you and what you have to leave for your family behind and for the future. So I think that should help the seafarers and their families. Thank you very much for giving this time. Thanks up for my input. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We had one more question. But did you... Oh, there are many questions from the group. I thought it was a QR code, huh? <laughs> Impromptu, huh? Does the uh, time allow two questions from the audience? Okay. One question, please. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Philip, for calling me senior and not older. Thank you so much. It improved my mental health immediately. Uh, sir, I have a question uh, to the panel. Uh, the mental health challenges on board when you are dealing with, how many of these challenges are because of situation on board and how many emanated because there was something happening ashore which had nothing to do with the ship? What's the, what's the percentage or how would you rate that? So, uh, with my experience, how much or little I have, is uh, the maximum uh, counselings and the, uh, you know, sessions I've had, most of it have been related not because of what's happening on ship. It is because either something is happening in the family or something which is happening ashore. Uh, yes, only during COVID times, there were factors related for ship, but that was something which was unprecedented for, so that was it. But majority of the times it has been related with uh, family issues, personal issues, which they get to know and they are not able to cope with it and then they really want to go back. They are not able to go back and then that escalates their uh, mental uh, stability on board. So yes, work related, it has, for, at least in my experience, it has been less as compared to their personal issues and issues which they face ashore. Uh, anybody can else answer? Uh, they agree, they say so. Yes, yes. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Philip Matthews. First of all, congratulations to Captain Tushar Pradhan for coming out with this inheritance needs. Very uh, pertinent to have it. Well, uh, doc we are the finest doctors sitting here on the dais. My one question is, sir, you have been saying that the medical tests are inadequate, L1, L2 and all this. But why don't you as the people go to the administration? Everything is there written their kidney disease, this, that. So what is kidney disease? Go and tell them that you need ultrasound to do it. I find that people are coming for, uh, for pre-C medicals, having done medical seven days ago with bilateral colic, uh, you know, renal stones and all that. What stops you? You have taken the Hippocratic oath. So you are the persons to put up, you should not come under pressure of any company and say, chalo, ye chalta hai, fit hai, ye, No, please stop it. It is 
up to you all. Second thing, sir, you said that, uh, you know, in, uh, for the armed forces, for every vacancy you get 1,000 people. Yes, very true. You know the cost today, you get candidates who sell their house, who sell their land and come here to pay fees of 7 to 8 lakhs to join a DNS course or a GME course at 6 lakhs. See, this is not very easy to attract and the metro cities are not willing to send their people. And as it is, responsibilities on board for seafarers have reduced to such a level that every mostly all things are controlled ashore. It's becoming difficult to attract the brightest talent to this career. How do we fight this out? If somebody can throw some light, thank you so much. Uh, may I address the first step? Uh, thank you, Captain Matthews. Uh, you will recall that in 2009, SCI outsourced their medical examination to private uh, service. Sir, let us not name any company, you know, it doesn't matter. Because, see, uh, I was in SCI, it was history, but let us not go into that. Because we have a system in DJ. We learn from history, Captain Matthews. We must learn from history and not make the mistakes that historical events have led us to. So, L1 was the one which was the most favored. They should have been some. Sir, I am sorry. I would not like to bring in SCI because SCI never had a problem with whatever L1 or anything has had. See, let us not go into controversy. SCI has one of the finest medical systems. I work for another company today, but I take objection to naming anybody. Doesn't make sense. Uh, we as doctors are trying to get an appointment face to face with the regulator for years. If somebody can help us, we will be very happy. The rest I leave to Dr. Matthews to take on. Uh, Dr. Balani, I am mean, just uh, answering that question. Actually, we don't have any association of doctors, of practitioners. And uh, most of the rules are made by the regulator without uh, checking. I mean, just for your information, I think very informed audience here. When the airlines has to select their uh, medical examiners, the, they go through a very rigid system, uh, a stringent system, and select the medical examiners for uh, checking them, and they go through a full process before they are recruited as pilots. Even the cabin crew and everybody goes through proper examiners. Today, we've got great dilution of standards, and that's one of the big problems that we face. Uh, we are trying to reach up to the regulators through our associations, uh, through the MASA, FOSMA and INSA. And uh, today I can see a lot of energy coming in these organizations, these associations. And I'm sure uh, we have very experienced and respected people today in the uh, associations. And I'm sure they will help us in reaching to the regulators. And uh, just for your information, tomorrow in the morning at 11 o'clock, we have a meeting with the DG Shipping on some of the regulations. So we hope to put some of these points. They've called us for the meeting, and I hope uh, the associations will back us during our uh, One uh, Second point, you will not believe it. I have been crying for the last 25 years. We don't have a medical book for the seafarers. Companies have made their own. Anglo Eastern has made their own book. There are a few companies who got their own book. But there is no hand medical book. So we do not know what one person who is coming to us is having from the previous company. It's, so, so because we don't have this, we don't have I mean, tell me one thing, in the armed forces if you have, there's no GDPR in the armed forces. So only GDPR will apply to the marine fleet. It becomes a state secret. If somebody is not well, or he's got a psychiatric problem, or he's been repatriated, it is very important for the industry to know this. Today we are doing Jasusi to find out what the person, the guy comes with a bypass, he lies there quietly, he's got a scar and he says, you know, some operation was done on me. We are actually doing chore police and that's the unfortunate thing. So, unless the industry wakes up, 
the standards will not come up. And you have more clout than us to put this across to the regulators. And I'm sure we could take a consent from them when we are passing the medical information. They keep the book with them, but the doctor has to know what is the history. Otherwise, we have no clue. I reject somebody, he goes to the next clinic, and he passes. Is it fair? That's for the industry to answer. Thank you. Uh, my name is Prabhat Nigam. I come from Chitkara University, Chandigarh, and also represent Maritime Trainers Guild. I am in a bit of dilemma after hearing uh, some of the people who speak about mental health. And uh, the best person to answer me will be Dr. Deepti Mankar. Uh, Dr. Deepti, you had been telling me that pre-C institutes need to attend this kind of uh, conferences about mental health which you conduct. Now my dilemma is, I am attracting a person to join Merchant Navy. He has come from some village in Punjab, Haryana, Himachal, joined me as a pre-C cadet. And now, in the very first year, I am telling him, this job is not good, it's a mental health problem. Hai. So, what do I do? What is right? Please tell me. Hello, Captain Prabhat. I think you had asked me this question when we were doing the survey also. So, uh, firstly, I, we never tell them not to join. Secondly, we never tell them mental health issues, only seafarers, all who are seafarers have mental health issues. It's, all, it's a global issue today. Somebody in your family could have it. Somebody, your friend could have it. It is not telling them there is a mental health issue. It is about introducing the subject to be aware. How in school we have biology. We study about physical health. Why can't we study about mental health? What is the problem? So we are not telling them not to join the profession. We are saying to include it as a subject. Especially in seafaring, Physical fitness is given so much importance. We've heard it from such experienced people here. And it's spoken about so openly. We are discussing kidney stones. We are discussing eye problem, appendix, dental health. Why not mental health? So it is not about telling them that, oh God, if you come into this profession, you're going to land up having a mental health problem. No. It is about understanding your state of mind, understanding about emotional hygiene. How much of us do we do it at home? Do we teach our children? No. We don't teach our children how to lose, how to cope with it. We only tell them you have to win, perform best, you have to get top rank, do put in this class, that class. No. So what happens that even if a five-year-old child loses in Ludo at home playing with you, he freaks out and he'll blame you. You have done some, you know, cheating and so I have lost. We are not teaching them how to accept failure, how to how to cope with rejection in case you face it. None of us are teaching our children that. And that's the reason as they grow up, they are more prone to having such kind of emotional difficulty in coping up with scenarios. So my take on this is the reason I want it to be as a sub, it's a beautiful subject. Everybody should learn it. Psychology. Why should we wait for it that when something happens to me, then I get a light bulb and then I will do it. Joshi ma'am is sitting here with all due respect if I can say she's fought cancer. We have been talking about mental health from the whole year and today only she told me I think I can also you know uh, talk about mental health now because I've gone through it and I understand the importance of it. So the way we discuss about taking care of our physical health it's very essential we take care of our mind as well. And to sum it up we have doctors for everything. You have a bone problem you'll say yes let, tell me a good orthopedic. Heart issue, you go to cardiac, cardiologist. Eyes, nose, ENT, neurons, you go to neurologist. So when something is not right here, you're not feeling good. Why can't you meet a counselor? Why can't you meet a psychiatrist? Get yourself treated. It's fine. It's okay not to be okay. So it's about understanding the subject. You will understand yourself better and you'll be able to take care of it. So in case you do feel that, oh, I'm hitting low, you know that, okay, this is what I need to do now. I can take care of myself, I know whom to go to, I know I can speak to someone and it is okay to be not okay on certain days. So it's about knowing yourself and I think it's very important, everyone should go through it, not only cadets, everyone. Thank you, sir. Hi, 
Uh, yes, this is going off very well. Uh, it's a brilliant subject and we are all very passionate about it. But the clock tells us that the lunch is getting cold. So I will ask this panel to please close. Uh, in the meantime, I must tell everyone that uh, uh, you know this subject is really vast and there is lots of concerns. So while I was sitting there, I've, uh, I think what we need is a similar conference based uh, simply on maritime medical. So where we will be able to bring the, um, uh, what do you call, the authorities uh, to a conference. We will also be able to bring the industry to the same conference and get all the medical fraternity to join in. So I think that will also be a platform that will also bring about collaboration which is what we have been talking about all the time and we should be able to get some results out of it, probably a good paper which can then be circulated and uh, things taken forward. Thank you. Thank you sir. As we come to the end of this panel discussion, I would uh, like to invite Mr. Pradeep Kulkarni also to join us on stage. Mr. Pradeep Kulkarni, please join us. I invite uh, Mrs. H.K. Joshi, former CMD of Shipping Corporation of India and a stalwart in the maritime sector, to please uh, felicitate the panelists and the moderator. I think after the reference, Deepti made, I am the right person to felicitate all the speakers out here. So in order, we have uh, Mr. Pradeep Kulkarni, Claims Head, Marine Insurance, Ace Insurance. We have uh, Dr. Dipti Mankar, Wellness Coach, Founder Director, MindSpeak. <laughs> Mr. Rabjot Kuman, Founder and Director, 3Cube Medicare Private Limited. Mr. Manish Pradhan, Managing Director, Global Dry Fleet Synergy Marine Group. Dr. Jacob Matthew, Chairman and Managing Director, Seabird Medicare Group. Captain Tushar Pradhan, General Secretary, the Maritime Union of India. <laughs> Dr. V. Z. Benani, Dr. Benani's Blue Shield Medical Clinical LP. Mr. Adrian Stray, CEO and Managing Partner, Stray Partners AS. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, everyone. We now uh, break for lunch and uh, we come back at. I missed out on this one, this group photograph, please.
questions. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.